Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. Tonight's format is an open forum for siblings, family, and friends of Evoke. You're always welcome if you're a, a former parent of ours to share this link with your family and friends so they can attend and, and find out what we're all about. We also like to offer it for siblings so siblings can attend these. If you want to ask a question for on behalf of a sibling, if you want to ask a question about siblings, this is your opportunity to do that. They can also ask them directly. And if you're asking for them, if you're if you're passing the question on to us or you're a live participant this evening, just let me know your age if you're a sibling. That helps me tailor my answer and make sure that I'm speaking to the audience. As you're attending this evening, I'm going to take the first pre-submitted questions. You can always, out of, uh, for these, you can always send in questions in advance to webinar at evoketherapy.com. You can make re requests, suggestions, questions for the live, the live uh, broadcast, and that is your connection. And you can also ask for slides for the, the, the topic form. So if you have a, a topic that you're listening to and I'm sharing quotes and you want to look at the slides, you're welcome to do that. All right, let me get right into the first question that's pre-submitted. Somebody writes this. It's a long one. It's in three parts. Somebody writes this. My son is 18 and has been home for 10 months. Previously, he was in wilderness for over three months and spent the nine months in therapy. He was angry and, ab and abusive verbally and would, not, and would break things and confront his mother in the past. Now, we are seeing a pattern of him being more verbally abusive towards his mother again, more cordial to his father, but still can be disrespectful. We disengage and work on ourselves and have boundaries. He will not see a counselor, and we have suggested not push one. Recently, he requested all the paperwork on his birth family so that he, so that he might, so that might be why he is more abusive. Not an excuse, but perhaps. He said he did not want to find his birth mother and said he knew his adopted, his adopted mother was his mother. It seemed to be a good conversation, but his mother offered to help him connect with his family if he changed his mind. Part two, he seems to be able to talk to his mother about his frustrations, but at the same time, he is the most abusive towards her, more than disrespect. It is abusive language and demeaning. Is this abuse directed toward his mother tied to his hurt from his birth mother? Is this displaced aggression? His mother disengages and removes herself from the situation. He is going back to not being accountable for his actions, blaming his behavior on his mother mostly or father occasionally. Our last resort will be to remove him from the house but we do not want to be pushed to this. He currently has a lot of pressure to graduate high school and he wants to go to college. He also has ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder and moderate drug di diagnosis dependency. He is challenging. He is challenged with regulating his emotions. And part three, we think he is trying to use bodybuilding currently to move through this, dis his disappointments and regrets. And we are supporting a gym membership and healthy foods. Yet he'll tell me, I want to find a way not to be related to you. Then later he starts talking to you like nothing happened. Some of this is teenage maturity, but it is more than that. I guess you could say that his mother is a container listening to him, but then it is abusive and she withdraws, withdraws. It seems to be getting to be too much. She wants to be his parent, but it is grueling, mentally fatiguing. I know we need to work on ourselves and know this is a marathon and we need to be patient. But is there anything impactful we can do or say that is short and our son would hear? Is there a point that we, we would, where we, we say we are done trying to help you or talk to you? My wife stops talking to him as he wants. And then he clearly tries to talk to her again as it seems he wants a relationship. First of all, as always, I'll just start off by saying that's a very, very difficult situation. And I have a few thoughts about it. First and foremost, he's 18. I want to remind the people listening that he's 18. So you you have an option. An option exists that you can ask him to leave the home. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just reminding you that that option exists. I think some of your questions about what might be triggering this feeling are just as good as any. But really, it's not really important why he's doing it. In the sense that, I mean... That sounds counter to a lot of what I teach because I always talk about 
don't focus on the behavior and, and try to understand why. But when it when it reaches the threshold or crosses the threshold of being abusive, it, it is sometimes our instinct as as human beings, as as those of us who struggle with codependency and boundaries, to let our our empathy for what might be going on or what what is going on to rob us of our boundaries. So again, and this is my, my, my method, my approach, my sensibility all the time. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm giving you psychological permission to do what you need to do. I don't think it serves anybody for him to be continuously chronically abusive and for you to tolerate it in the name of being a container. A container has limits, right? It has edges. It has capacity. It, it it's not necessary as a container to be all, all capable, right? To, to, to hold everything. If there's no limit to the container, then the child doesn't feel the safety of the walls of being contained. And so being a, a human being, meaning being a parent, for a child to experience the, the edges of your limits is okay. Then they have to learn how to deal with another. So as you give me the background and context of your story from what I can read in our exchange, it sounds like you're doing all the work that you need to do and you're showing patience. One question I have is steroids. If when you talk about using bodybuilding, you're not talking about regular exercise. You know, somebody who exercises, you know, four to six times per week as a part of a, a healthy regimen, you, you alluded to bodybuilding. And this does sound like some of the side effects of steroid usage. So I, I'm, I'm just curious about that. But again, regardless of where it's coming from, you have the right to say enough is enough. And so I don't have any magic phrase or, or, or offer for you about what might stop it. But I, I can say that sometimes the only thing that somebody will listen to is the boundary. And, and, and I'm not talking about you know, I speak to, to, to a broad audience. There are some people that can contain very little, have very little bandwidth and capacity to hold information and feelings and, and, and what somebody's going through. And there are some people that, are, that have an, an unending amount of capacity. And oftentimes that person comes from a place of should, or I'm doing the right thing, or I need to do this. And if I don't do this, he or she or they are going to feel rejected or, or dejected or angry or sad or abandoned. It's going to bring up something for them. So again, I, my instinct from your question is that you're, you're approaching the, the, the point where setting a boundary might be the only thing that he will listen to. The only thing that he will respond to. And, and, and you get to decide where that is. I don't get to tell any of you where your limit is. But what I can say is it's not the ideal. It's not what I'm trying to teach when I say, be a container, be a listener, be curious about what's beneath the behavior, especially when you're talking about an 18 year old, especially when you're using that word abusive, which, which, you know, on its surface says it's exceeding normal behavior. It's, it's exceeding the, the, the typical person's or, or, or your, your wife, the mother's uh, capacity. And so the, you, you don't need to be a doormat. You don't need to not have a self. Children need to experience the, the selfhood of their parents. This is what Carl Jung meant when he said, the unlived life of a parent is the greatest burden for a child to carry. And part of what he's saying, you get to show up. You get to be present. You get to request, require your needs, your emotional safety to be considered and, and attended to. So part of psychotherapy, a large part of psychotherapy in a lot of cases is learning to peel away the shoulds and the shouldn'ts. The idea about what's the right thing to do and what do you need in this particular dynamic, this particular situation. So that's, that's my response is, Take care of yourself. Make sure you're okay. If it's okay for you, if you have the bandwidth in all of, uh, you know, I have more, much, much more bandwidth than I had five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's, that's for sure. 
my bandwidth capacity waxes and wanes from day to day, sometimes from hour to hour based on what I'm doing, how hungry, how tired I am, how much stress, how much work I have on my plate. But it's okay. And I have been thinking about this this week. So many times when I get asked a question that, that, that somewhere within it has the, the implication of what should I do or what's the right thing to do, I, I just want to remind, remind you, that's not really what mental health and, and, and self-help and healing and recovery are, are about. It's about what do you need? What's okay with you? What can you do? What are you able to do? You can increase capacity, but again, it's not the ideal. It's not the goal to have unending amounts of capacity because if a child doesn't experience the limitations of a parent, they won't know what it's like to live with an other. Children need to experience our limitations to some extent. And we don't, we don't arbitrarily or, or, or uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do it from a contrived place where we just have a limit just to teach them the lesson. But when they experience us as a person, then they have to learn how to deal with people, how, how to deal with others in their life. And that translates to boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, partners, friends, colleagues, coworkers, society, right? So there's a lot in there. And it sounds like you have a really great foundation. And, and I just want to make sure that you give yourself permission to take care of yourself to have it be a priority. Everything else is built on top of or related to your self-care. And then from that place, the, the child's life is theirs. They have to figure out, I, I said this to somebody today, they are the, the knight in shining armor that's going to come to rescue them. They are their own knight. It's not us. Some of your, your psychological therapeutic guesses about where it might be coming from are interesting. And if he's willing to talk about it, it's fantastic. But sometimes, sometimes the, the, the rage and the abuse is a great distraction. And the only thing that's going to bring him to the table where it's a conversation might be that difficult boundary. I, I don't know, but that's a possibility that I at least want to, I want to offer it as an option that you get to choose. So. Thank you very much. Next question writes, somebody writes, one of my favorite of all time podcasts of yours was the recent transport podcast, a theme I did not think about prior to utilizing a transport professional recommended by our educational consultant was the relationship I have with our son around integrity. He knows I never lie to him. Integrity is an immutable value he values in me. Can you expound on this value or other connecting values that can, that can contribute to a positive trend in the parents and child's journey and relationship. Well, you know, I, no, nothing jumps out. I'll just kind of talk my way through this answer. Um, it, it, you know, you, you're the goal in life, I think, I mean, this is my value, the goal in psychotherapy, the goal in treatment is for individuals to become who they are, their genuine, authentic, or, or real self. And while to some that might sound crazy or, or scary, because like I say all the time, a lot of people have been told that there's a right way to be and that we are to raise our children to be good people. The real core value in attachment theory is authenticity and the real self. So each individual parent brings their, those gifts of, of themselves to the child. Creativity, uh, problem-solving skills, honesty and integrity, like you said, kindness, whatever it is that's an important part of, of you. You know, I, I think about, I've been thinking about this a lot this week, this idea that as a thought exercise, okay, this is a thought exercise. When your child is, you know, 14, 15, 16 and older, as a thought exercise, you might practice thinking about the fact that 
all the damage is done in a sense, in, in terms of, of, of parenting and all the gifts are, have been given. I think sometimes when parents think, well, first of all, the, the whole shift in, in this parenting model and what we know about child development is to shift away from fixing the child to, to fixing yourself. That's the essence of this work. And the great and grand trap in, in, in the world, in our culture, in our society, even within the treatment field, is that we're going to give you some template, some engineering instructions to figure out how to right the wrongs and correct the mistakes and, and, and repair the damage. And there are definitely things that we teach and go through that can help facilitate some of that healing and moving forward. But sometimes, and that's why I bring up this thought exercise, sometimes we get held hostage by the idea that, that our, our goal, our, our practice is about how do I fix the child? I'm terrified that I see this pattern or, or that pattern or this trait or that trait. And, and I can project into the future about the, the, the disaster that is going to ensue if this doesn't get fixed. So the thought experiment that I offered is to stop thinking about engineering your child and really do the work of, of figuring out your own peace of mind. Take back responsibility for serenity. Stop laying on, on your child the, the explicit or implicit message that they are the key to you having a good life, to you having serenity, to you being happy and okay. Too great of a burden for a child to bear. So I don't have any specific two or three values that, that, are, that are key and important. It's your authentic self. It's your real self. It's personal responsibility for your own journey, for your, your own happiness. It's realizing that your own, that your serenity, your happiness is your responsibility and, and not your child's. I, I personally value integrity like you do. My children value that in me. There are other values that, that I have that I'm sure many of you share. And we don't all share the same primary values. My values have, have, my values have changed and evolved throughout the years. Things I valued in my 20s and 30s are less important to me now. Some of them have gone away altogether. So, yeah, there's, there's nothing I, I can add to that. If you have a specific question, I'll do my best to respond to it. But all of you have unique gifts. All of you have unique talents. I was thinking about this today, and I'll, I'll say this before I go on to the next question. I think I was reflecting on the experience of, of parents, specifically moms, but I don't want to be biased toward one gender or another. But the guilt that, that, that because of the way that our culture looks at parenting, that a lot of mothers feel and carry for, for how their child is doing. So I, I wrote this little post that I'm going to share in the next couple of days to mothers. And it says something like, dear mothers, you know, when you read a, a parenting quote, a parenting concept or principle somewhere, and it, it triggers a sense of guilt as you compare yourself to the ideal that you're learning about. I would encourage you to ask yourself the question, quote, why, or, or excuse me, was this modeled in my childhood? Unquote. Because before you were a parent, you were a child. And, and sometimes the, the generational transmission of, of trauma and the healing and the redirecting of that takes time and takes work. So, yeah, my, my, my invitation is toward grace. It's, it's, a weird, it's a weird paradox that I spend the bulk of my career teaching parents about parenting and at the same time trying to, to remove the idea that's, that it's a simple cause and effect relationship. And it really can't be, I don't know how to describe it except for to say it's kind of like hitting a tennis ball. If you try to aim it, you lose accuracy and power. If you practice 
and, and you 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 practice the skills and the tools and, and you kind of don't think and relax, you regain or, or or maintain your accuracy and your power. It's the same with art, right? Fear is is the enemy of creativity. Fear is the enemy of of, of parenting in a sense. And it, it's something we all have to contend to so that what that means is that we have to attend to it. But this is, it, it's a weird, strange paradox between letting go, surrender, and at the same time working on yourself and being curious about your contribution to a dynamic or to a cycle. And it's hard to, to explain that in, in great detail because each situation, each individual each parent-child relationship is, is unique and there's no generic way to dissect it and, and explain it, to, to quantify it. But it's a practice. It's a practice of the balance between will and surrender. It's the yin and the yang. There are choices to make. There are things to work on. And ultimately, I have to surrender. So I don't know how well I did in answering your question, but... That's what it triggered for me. That's what it inspired for me. Somebody writes, what if you do, what, what do you do if aftercare wants to start your kid at the beginning of a program, making them earn privileges already had at Evoke? Also, is family model good model for aftercare? Is family model, I'm not sure what family model, tell me if that's a specific brand or, or approach that I'm not, I'm not sure about. Is family model good model? You know, I think it's important to, to push back and to challenge any treatment professional. Like I always say, it's really important to ask difficult questions or to be empowered, I might say, to ask difficult questions and to expect intelligent answers. That's important. And if the program simply labels you as resistant or a difficult parent or if they they shame you with the intention of getting you back into compliance getting you back into line they're not doing their work they're they're, they're performing inadequate therapy inadequate parent coaching and education so yeah i mean the, 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 i think a lot of the programs have done a great job in, in over the last decade or so, maybe a little bit more, at understanding that you have to differentiate a child from uh, wilderness therapy versus somebody coming from home because there's a difference. And when I was younger, it's really about the, the, the need to control things. You write good, I think this is important, good therapy programs allow for, of course, different levels, but allow for some mess, some mistakes. It's not all about good behavior, right behavior going forward. That's not how human beings learn. That's not how we, we grow. That's not how we expand and enlarge ourselves, right? Growth and, and, and mental health is not a linear quick process. It's a lifelong process. So your question tells me that you have good instincts, mom and dad, whoever wrote this question, your questions tell me that you have, that you have in, in valuable instincts and questions. And again, um, I, I'm not sure what you mean when you say is the family model, a good model, Becky, do I have a, a, a qualifying answer to that question about what that refers to is family model, good model for aftercare. Family systems. Well, I'm a, that's that I have a PhD in marriage and family therapy and marriage and family therapy is based on the family systems model. Um, it can be a really effective model for aftercare for sure. Understanding the dynamics, but again, there's the, the thing about atta the attachment model that we use is that within it, it suggests that everybody's different, that you don't apply a generic template to anybody, that you're flexible. 
and that what might work for one family, one, one child might not work for the child sitting next to them or the next family. What might work for one child in the beginning might not work for the child weeks later, months later. So I, 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 my therapist talks about this all the time. I try to steer away from uh, these, these will sound like religious terms and they're not, I try to steer away from dogma, dogmatic models, rigid models. You know, I, I, I try to be, um, agnostic, theoretically speaking, no biases. I might do, I might have a very different approach with one client versus another client versus one family versus another family. So part of what I think you're asking for that's implicit in your question, which I honor and respect, even if you were talking about me and if you're, if you were my client or, or at evoke is you want to be seen, you want to make sure that it's individualized. And I think what I hear implicit in your question is that you're not having that experience, that it sounds generic. And I would support you in challenging that system, challenging that, that, that profile, asking questions and, and, and again, listening to the answer, meaning do they have an intelligent justification for why they're doing what they're doing? And, and within that, that, that justification of that approach, can they also show some flexibility? That's what I hear from your question. That's what I read into your question. And I would share that the, the great the earlier, the better earlier. The, it's not going to get easier later. You know, later on, you're going to say, well, we've invested so much time in this process and we don't want to, to alienate the, the, the clinical team or, or the therapist and have that come out some way on our, onto our child earlier, the better at evoke at any program at, with any therapist. See the therapist is supposed to be not just for the child, but for you, in a sense, the parent that neither of you ever had. And therapy is to be the family that you never had. So when a, when a client confronts me or asks a difficult question or expresses frustration, hurt, anger, sadness, the sense of not being seen, I know we have the greatest opportunity to model what, what being a, a healthy parent, a capable adult, recovering parent, is, which is, thank you for telling me it takes a lot of courage. It, it's a great risk to challenge me and tell me how you feel. I am in this moment, in this instance, the authority figure, I have power over you. And these programs have power over you and your family and your child. You are all vulnerable. And so with that awareness, with that reality, we have to be incredibly sensitive to not misuse that power, to not overvalue compliance and cooperation. When I had my son, it's been 16 years since he was in a therapeutic program. But one of the things that, that a colleague told me is stop buying to, trying to be a good parent, Brad, with regards to the program and, and, and tell them how you're feeling. And I know you want to be that, that good, easy parent. You don't want to make waves or rock the boat but it's getting in the way of you telling the truth and of getting your needs met and ultimately getting your child's needs met in this process. And when you challenge a therapist, you, you find out pretty quickly the level of work. I'm not talking about their intelligence. There are a lot of very, very smart therapists. You find out the, the depth, the character of the therapist, the capacity of the therapist, the, the, the central uh, ability of the therapist, you find out how they're going to respond to your child when the child has, has a, a, an idea. See, cooperation, compliance is the most common form of resistance in psychotherapy. We don't, we don't want to value compliance and cooperation. We want to have a balance of it. Violence, acting out, anger um, that, that is that is leaking out on other people, substance use, self-harm. You know, a, a lot of those symptoms in children and in adults, for that matter, 
are the expression of an unmet need. They, they are the, the last resort. Like Dr. Martin Luther King said, violence is the language of the unheard, or exp specifically a riot is the language of the unheard. My therapist talks about one of her book books that violence and, and, and rebellion is kind of a last resort. So I, I just empower you to, to, to hold your, your, your therapist and your program accountable by showing up and telling the truth and see how they respond. And if they respond by putting you in your place, by telling you simply how you're wrong, by, by making you the problem, by never apologizing for mistakes or, or missteps, because every program, every therapist on the earth is going to make mistakes and have missteps. And the thing that differentiates a, a good therapist from, from a not good enough therapist is not whether or not they make a mistake, but how they respond to a mistake when it's made. Do they apologize? Do they take, do they model what we're trying to teach your child? Do they model for you what, what we're trying to teach you? You, it's really the, the, the great secret about discovering whether or not your therapist is adequate enough is by telling them when you're upset with them and how they respond will be all the information you need to know about how good they are. So thank you for that. Somebody writes, my sophomore moved out of high, high pressure elite school to attend an alternative self-paced high school. She is thriving academically and her social stress is much lower because she feels more free to be her authentic self. I think she's in the right place. The challenge is that as she gets to know her peers better, she's discovering that many are dealing with some very tough issues, suicidal ideation, cutting, eating disorders, and peers are starting to lean on her for support, which is causing her stress to resurface. Any advice on how to coach her on navigating this in a healthy way? That's, I'm smiling a, a bit because that makes all the sense in the world. You know, those of us who've been in therapy, those of us who are drawn to co go into therapy as clients, I mean, those of us who have struggled with, with mental health issues, struggled with um, generational trauma, generational patterns, we fall into these roles often. And so part of what I would say to, to that daughter is relate to her more, more than anything. I think that's the most powerful way to respond, just to relate to, and, and to, to, to share examples, not that are all packaged and, and tied in a bow, about where, you know, my own codependency, if I'm the, if I'm the parent, my own codependency is I will give of myself too much. You know, the thing that's going to cut my life short, barring some freak accident, and I want to be as clear about this as I can, the thing that is taking years off the end of my life and I still expect to live a fairly long life. But the thing that, that's, that, that puts me at risk is my codependency. Some of you might have heard the interview I did with Gabor Mate when I shared with him that I had MS and he went through a series of questions with me. MS is, is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself, right? It attacks the, the myelin sheath the, the covering of the nerves and they become inflamed and they become um, dysfunctional. They stop working. So my own body is showing, is demonstrating that, that if I don't take care of myself, I will die early. It puts my life at risk. I heard somebody say one time, a friend, a colleague say to me, well, codependency never killed anybody. And I thought to myself, it kills people every day. It's the most insidious. In fact, I think it's the core issue of all addictions and, and most mental health. It's in there. So having said all of that, I, I think what I would say to, to you is not in, a, not in a hurry, not in a bombastic way, not in an anxious, controlling way, but find ways to share examples almost unrelated to her story about your own codependency. 
about how you're inclined to give of yourself too much. How, how taking care of yourself and having boundaries causes you shame and guilt. Model that for your child. Right? When we model for our child our own recovery, our own healing, our own human, fallible, and perfect process, process and progress in life, what we do is we give them permission to be human, to ask for help, to see it. When I'm working with a client of any age, with any issue, one of the things that I reinforce emphatically is when someone says, I struggle with this. I have this issue. And my response is, great. You see it. And they say, well, how do I make it go away? And I say, this is how you make it go away. You talk about it. You own it. You, you, you put it before you and you set it in front of you and you, you listen to it. You pay attention to it. You, you confess it to a therapist. You, you overcome eventually the shame and the guilt of having it. You overcome the, the instinct and the idea that you can get it right or become perfect. There have been a few uh, uh, shares on my social media this week about this issue. About It's not about the, the myth of today's age. And when I say today's age, I mean the last 200, 150 years. It's actually probably ever since sapiens became conscious of themselves. But the myth of today is not the, the, the subduing the bad parts of us, but integration. Not warring against ourselves like my body is doing with my multiple sclerosis, but learning to be gentle with ourselves, practicing self-compassion, overcoming guilt and shame in the idea that we can be perfect and get it right. It's not about being perfect. It's about being whole. So what I would do is find moments to model imperfection accountability, the, the, the genuine humil humility that exists that, that, that you have when you know that you're never going to get it right and that you don't have all the answers. I've been thinking about this a lot recently, this idea that I think many parents, many people think they're supposed to know all the answers. And, and that's crazy. My daughter was telling me that every once in a while, my, my daughter... Emma, who many of you know, who's a, who's, who's a coach at Evoke, who's finishing her PhD in clinical psychology. She says every once in a while, she has to remind herself that she doesn't need to know the answer. Somebody will ask her a question that in her mind that she thinks she should know the answer to. And, and she, 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 her initial instinct is to go out and answer. And then she reminds herself, I don't know that. And when she says, I don't know, She's modeling for parents, even though she's younger than most of the parents that she works with. I think virtually all the parents that she works with, she's modeling for them maturity and strength and, and what, it's, what it sounds like to be an adult. So thanks for the question. Next question. This is more of a theoretical question, but one I've thought about a lot without coming to a conclusion. I love this so far, by the way. What is the dividing line between the various things we humans do to our bodies for self-expression or fashion, piercings, tattoo, extreme exercise, weight gain or loss, even corsets or other constraining devices, crossing over into self-mutilation or self-harm. I'm a, physici a physician and have a particularly high regard for the armor that our skin provides, so I have little tolerance for violating it with needles and piercings. Having said that, I've had pierced ears since I was an adolescent. My 15-year-old uh, son is in, is, a, is in a residential treatment center and occasionally cuts on his arm with a piece of rock or stick. He usually doesn't break the skin. Nevertheless, staff intervene and he faces consequences for the self-harm. How do you think about and define the line between what is acceptable and not acceptable? Great question. I actually think about this all the time also. I mean, think about this. Our standards have changed. So a lot of it is, is a construct, what we think about piercings and tattoos. I... I, I I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but my mother, I don't know if she ever got a pier pierced ear or not, but I remember growing up, 
the whole time I was growing up in, in our home as a child, my mother never had pierced ears. She only had clips because her parents told her the people who had pierced ears were, and I won't even use the names, but they were less than trashy. And they used other words to describe them. So part of it is a construct. I feel differently about tattoos now than I did in my 20s. I feel differently when I see somebody with lots of tattoos than I did in my 20s. So my answer to the question is, you get to decide. That's the answer. And more, more precisely, you get to figure it out. I have had clients who have who have decided that some of their 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 changing of their body through piercings was self mutilation and they have reversed course. I have seen that before. I've seen other beautiful, creative, gifted souls go crazy with it. I remember recently I walked in to get a a sandwich at the local sandwich shop. This is about 2 months ago. And the, the, the cashier that was helping me had piercings all over her face. And she was the sweetest, kindest person that went out of her way. And there's some things that happened with my order that went wrong where she fixed it and was attentive to me and showed wonderful hospitality and hosting, hosting skills. And I remember walking out of that sandwich shop thinking, that's not the image that, that I grew up associating with, with face piercings. So... My answer is everybody gets to decide and, and more precisely gets to figure it out. You get to get tattoos and you get to have them removed if you want to. You get to have tattoos and you get to have piercings. And of course, some parents of a certain age will say, well, that you're not going to get a job. That's becoming less and less true. So my, my, my final answer to the question is I would practice not knowing what's true for other people. I would practice and replace knowing the answer to this question with curiosity. You know, overt self-harm is not necessarily the same as tattoos, although it could be a, a version. Either could be a version of the other. And that's something for your son to explore and to figure out and for the therapist around him. I will say that, that with self-harm, where one or two of my children have struggled with that, I've done my best to not focus on the behavior, to not worry about if a scar showed up that they wouldn't get a job later. I, I've done my best to teach them principles that I believed in, to, to share those with them, to make sure ultimately that they weren't putting their life at risk, but not to get distracted by the symptom. All right? that, that's, that's key in this evoke model, this attachment-based model. When we become focused on the symptom and, and subsequently managing the system, excuse me, managing the symptom, the symptom or the disorder wins because that's its goal. Its goal is to distract the individual and everybody around them from the authentic suffering that it's covering up. The famous quote again from Carl Jung, he's a very quotable person. That neurosis is the substitute form, is a substitute form of legitimate suffering. Neuroses is a substitute form of legitimate suffering, meaning that even though somebody might be displaying something that looks like it's hurting them, like self-harm, it's ultimately less painful for them than just feeling the authentic suffering. So we try to go to the authentic suffering. We try to get curious. We try to keep them safe. We try to keep them alive long enough and we try to create a context where they can feel safe enough to explore feel strong enough to explore the authentic suffering beneath the symptom we try to to to, to manage our own fear reactiveness anger rage terror at their symptoms we work out those feelings in other places in our own therapy and our own parent support groups and our own 12-step support groups. So as we take care of those, those feelings, those powerful, understandable feelings somewhere else, so that we, when we come back to the child, we can be there for the child. 
we can be available for the child. So that's my thought. Somebody writes, in your last talk on doing your work, I thought you said that the greatest freedom occurred once you realized you were in control of your own happiness. In theory, I agree. I think that if I had an abusive spouse or friend, I would decide to leave them. However, with a child, I think it is much more difficult to leave, to just leave the child, to just leave the child. Isn't there some moral scruples involved or is it based on how much one individual can take? I guess I was left thinking that you have to decide how to lose when it involves a child who does not inflict negativity into your life, who does inflict negativity into your life. It seems like you want to find happiness and it is more of a way to find balance between being a parent and being okay, but not necessarily happy. Maybe I misunderstood, so please clarify. I, I, I like your question because it's, it's again, it, like a lot of things, it's, it's nuanced. It's subtle, it's paradoxical. So let me do my best to kind of speak to your question. The transition from being a child to being an adult, the, one of the, the central tasks, this is the way that I, I try to say it, is understanding that, that ultimately the way that you're living your life is the source of your suffering or your peace of mind. And that doesn't mean that you won't experience pain because if you experience love, you're going to experience pain. If you experience love, you're going to experience loss. But that's different than the kind of suffering and serenity that I'm describing. What I'm talking about is when someone thinks that the key to happiness is outside of them. That if my child gets into the school that I think that they uh, can get into, then I'll be happy. If my parent, as an adult, if my parent figures out their stuff, then I can be happy. If my spouse stops drinking, then I'll be happy. Now, children are, are more vulnerable than adults. It, it's, it's, it's difficult to apply this to children, right? A five-year-old, a two-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, even a 16 or a 17-year-old who's, who's financially dependent upon a parent, it's difficult for them to say, well, I, you know, I, I can choose my own pathway. It is something to strive for, a way of being. To, to, to look towards. And, and the older you get, the more applicable it becomes. And, and part of what I say to adolescents is this. I say to them in our program, I say, this is the time from transitioning to it's my parents' fault and responsibility to make it better to, yes, this happened to me, and now I have to figure out how to deal with it. Because every context, every parent dents the child, scratches the child, right? It's impossible to, to escape childhood without any dents or bruises, and I'm speaking, of course, psychologically some more profoundly dented than others. But ultimately, the, the, the process of, of growing up is to take responsibility for the healing of those dents and, and of those bruises. And part of the healing is to say, my mom and dad did this. This happened to me. I, I feel it. it it's real. And it left me with, it left me with, with some kind of uh, legacy. They, they left me with a certain legacy, not just the negative, but the positives too, right? We, we hand over all of that to our children. And now that becomes my responsibility. J.D. Gill said in one of her books, all children are dented and bruised and all dents and bruises are worthy of our exploration. But in the end, the dents and the bruises are ours. And when I say even to... 14, 15, 16 year olds who get stuck, not the ones who are exploring the trauma, but the ones who get stuck and fixated on, it's my parents' fault. They need to make it better. They need to stop doing this. They need to, it's them. I can't be happy. I won't be okay. Part of what I say to them is so far that's been true. And, and now the question becomes, as you go forward, as you grow up into adulthood, what are you going to do about it? It's no different than if you had lost a parent to cancer, in a sense, in a, in a, in a philosophical sense. 
you have to deal with that. You have to figure out where you're going to, what you're going to do with that. And as parents, the, the, the adults that we are, conversely, to say that our children are making us miserable is to abdicate the responsibility for our own journey. And at the end of the day, part of the, 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 the responsibility, as I see it, of being an adult, being a, a parent who's an adult, is to say, yes, this is true. It, it's, it causes me grief. It hurts me to watch them hurt and to watch them suffer. And I had something to do with that. But it's my responsibility to, to find some kind of peace, some kind of serenity, to not outsource my sense of self to my child. And it is a lifelong process, and I work on it, and some days I do well, and some days I struggle. And if you talk to any therapist who's honest with themselves, they'll say the, the same thing. If you talk to any therapist who, who's not honest with themselves, they'll give you answers about how they've figured it out, how they've overcome it. But you work with it until the day that you die. That's my experience and observation in working with all kinds of people at, at all levels of mental health. So thank you for that. I hope that makes sense. I hope that addresses your question. All right, folks, it looks like that's all the time and all the questions for this evening. So um, I'll go through some upcoming slides, let you know what's, what our next broadcast is. You can get your camera ready. You can face your, your camera on your, on your phone if you want to, to the QR code, and it'll take you to the, to the respective webpage. My two books, The Journey of the Rogue Parent, The Audacity to Be, are available on Amazon and Audible. If you want to do it, we do have one spot available in our April 19th Finding You. I, I, I cannot emphasize enough how valuable I think this is to, to the entire family, to, to your child's well-being is attending something like a Finding You, a workshop to understand your own dilemmas, your own family of origin, your own patterns that are showing, showing up in your life today. So April 19th is the next offering. That's coming up quick, but we do have an offering. If you have any interest at all, contact Becky at evoketherapy.com or intensives at evoketherapy.com. Also, May 17th is the offering after that, if you need a little bit more time. May 19th through 21st, we have an online Finding You offering half the time, a third of the cost, and you don't have to travel. And a lot of great work gets done in the online offering. If you've been to any of the Finding Us and you want to come back, returning to you is that offering. The next available session is October 11th through 15th. And then we have a Finding You weekend in the UK. I think that is either one spot left or maybe filled, but you can contact intensives at evoketherapy.com to find out more information. We have custom Finding Connection intensives for couples and finding family for families. So to learn more contact again, our admissions folks, we have support groups each week for our current and alumni families in wilderness. April 13th is the next offering at 6 30 PM mountain time. Once a month, we have an alumni only meeting of our wilderness families. April 25th at 6 30 PM is the next offering for alumni only of our wilderness therapy programs. We have an intensive support groups each month. The next offering for that is May 9th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Contact Sarah D at evoketherapy.com or go to evoketherapy.com slash family dash involvement for more information. If you want an individual coach, a parent coach, a couples coach uh, for parent wraparound services afterwards for couple and intimacy issues, um, for transitioning between programs, during programs, support during, contact our, our coaching at evoketherapy.com email. We have over 40 coaches who are trained in the attachment-based model, many of whom have experience working in the treatment field, the wilderness field and in residential treatment field. So they, they, they know our philosophy. They know what it's like for families who are going through or been through this process. We encourage or ask, invite all current parents to attend six of any of the following 12-step 12, 12 support groups, alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, 
or adultchildren.org. Great. Adult children is a great option, really undervalued in the recovery field. You can also go to refugerecovery.org for a Buddhist-inspired recovery program with less of an, of an emphasis on a higher power, more of a mindfulness approach. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, is a great place in your local community for classes and resources. All these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. You can also go to SoundCloud, soundcloud.com on your computer and search there, Finding You. Or you can go to our, our Evoke's YouTube channel and watch the rebroadcast there with the slides and the video. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. And also, Evoke Intensives has an Instagram account with, in, with inspirational quotes, pictures, and so forth, reels. At Evoke Therapy Intensives is that handle. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And of course, our blog on the Evoke website has wonderful content from our staff and therapists each week. If you want to give back for people that can't afford treatment, if that's something that you feel inspired to do, our three charitable, par charitable partners include choosementalhealth.org, skyesthelimitfund.org, or the evoke Fam or evokefamilyfoundation.org. All right, folks. I hope I got to all your questions. I hope this is a helpful point of contact in all the work that you do. For and on behalf of the people that love you, thank you for coming and being willing to do your work. My next broad broadcast will be April 18th. That's a week from tonight at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm really excited. This is my favorite topic to talk about, using myth and metaphor in therapy. So thanks for joining me this evening. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.